Hello and welcome to our webinar uh, with Craig Bachman. Uh, he is all set up uh, out there in Seattle, which is sunny and warm right now, uh, whereas I am in snowy Indiana in the middle of April. Um, we're going to get started. Craig's going to, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to go through, a lot of great information. Uh, Craig's a great trainer. If you've never watched any of his stuff, uh, we have a lot of videos um, here that he's uh, done before. Uh, you can go and watch those on our YouTube channel. Uh, I just want to say, uh, before we get started, we currently have a promo going on. You can get a free Notch Pro access uh, with the coupon code FREEPRO on any order over 600 bucks. Um, hey, Kale. Oh, oh, hi, Craig. How's it going? Hey, Kale. Yeah. Hi there. Hey, I'm getting a bunch of echo. I wonder if you've got two mics live or something there, buddy. I do. I know what's going on here. That'll end in a second. Uh, I'm going to throw it right over to Craig, uh, and we're just going to go ahead and uh, get started. Hey, what's up, everybody? Greetings from sunny Seattle. You probably don't believe me, but it really is. It's 70 degrees and sunny here in Seattle. I think it was sunny the last time that we did a webinar off my deck here in North Seattle. You wouldn't know that it rained six months of the year here. But anyway, hey, I'm super excited to be with you. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, a couple of people I really want to be sure I appreciate and say thank you to before we get started. One is to Tree Stuff. Tree Stuff, Nick Bonner, Kale Royer, our technical wizard extraordinaire. Thank you all for making this possible. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with this awesome group of people who have logged in from all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, Western Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, Europe, uh, Southern Hemisphere. I don't know where everybody's from, but it's awesome to have you here. Thanks for taking time. Uh, I am excited to talk about this subject because it's such a big part of what we do using chainsaws. One is super fun. And two, it can be done safely or it can be done in a dangerous way. And there's always something new to learn. I'm learning things. I'm going to learn from your questions today. I've got some cool things to share with you, things that I believe will be helpful to improve your productivity, your skill set and efficiency, and your safety out in the field. And I'm hoping that you will send us in questions. Uh, Kale on the background will uh, handle some of those. I've got an earpiece in. So if you see me making funny faces, just assume it's the earpiece listening to Kale back there. And uh, he's going to be feeding some questions, I think, interjecting for us. We're working on a CEU quiz so you can get credit for your time listening to this webinar. But most importantly, I want to make this as participatory as we can. Have a good time. As Kale mentioned, we got some videos that we shot. Uh, <laughs> we're here on my deck. There aren't a lot of trees to cut down on my deck. But that's as far as the Ethernet cable reaches. So this is where we're doing it. But we shot some videos a couple of weeks back. We'll interject some things. We'll do some live cutting. We'll talk about some saws. And we're going to have a good time. I do want to make one thing clear. This is about skills, knowledge, safety. It's not about technology. It's not about what saw is cool or another. I do have some fun things to show you, some things that are preferences to me. Um, you'll notice that I'm a Husqvarna guy. Um, and we're going to talk about battery saws today. Uh, not in great detail, but some. There's some safety considerations that are a little different than gas saws. There's some behavior of them that's a little bit different. But I tell you what. I love my battery saws. I got, I don't know, four or five of them sitting here. They're my go-tos. Uh, and I want to compliment Husqvarna for one, the work they've done to develop a very, very high quality, high performance, professional grade battery saw. Uh, it's my preference, uh, but I'm not here to sell you on saws. You're just going to see me using these. Please interject with questions. We got gas saws out here. We got top handle saws. We got ba battery saws. We got rear handle saws. We got all kinds of stuff. So um, thank you to Tree Stuff, thank you to Husqvarna, and thanks to all of you. And what I'm gonna share today really has come from so many other people that have been mentors and influences to me. You may know the saying that uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I didn't invent this stuff. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a genius, I'm just a tree worker. I'm an arborist like you are out there in the field doing the job day to day. And I wanna share with you some things that I've learned 
And I hope that one, you can implement them and two, that you'll pass them on to other people on your crew, in your company, in your community, so we can all keep learning. And again, send in those questions and I'll answer as many of them as we can. We do have a limited time frame today. We got two hours, less a couple of minutes right here. And, uh, and we could go on forever talking chainsaws. And so I'm gonna try to stick to you know, some content that we have identified, get you some key points, some key takeaways that you can apply starting tomorrow when you go into the field. And uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can, but we are gonna have to stay focused. So let's jump into it. First thing, just like on any job site, uh, my crew, which happens to be my wife here today, and I prepared a JSA, a job safety assessment. You may call it a job hazard assessment. And I bring this up every time that we do training. You probably can't read it, so you're gonna have to take my word for it. But what we did is we identified where we are working today. That's probably super bright. I'll turn it around this way. Identified where we're working today, the nearest urgent care, that we're calling 911 for life-threatening emergencies. We have a telephone. Does anybody call it a telephone anymore? We've got a phone, a cell phone. We've got a first aid kit. We got a fire extinguisher back over here. Uh, we've identified that my wife, Joanna, is gonna be responsible for communications if there is an emergency situation. And then we identified our site hazards. Literally being here on my deck, we don't have a lot of them. I do sure hope I don't fall off the deck in the middle of this. I guess that's a hazard. Uh, and we're not gonna be cutting any full-size trees today, but I do have some bolts with us, these sections of wood, four or five feet long, and we are gonna do some live cutting, at least that's the intention. And so we are running power tools. So I've got all my PPE with me as well. So we prepared this JSA, we both reviewed it together, signed off on it, and we're ready to get started in our work. I'm gonna set this over here where we can all find it if we need it and let's get going. I put some notes together for myself because I was thinking about other things up until about 30 minutes ago. So I wanna make sure that I stay on track for you. Uh, one is a quick introduction. Uh, I probably know many of you, some of you have participated in my webinars before. I really appreciate you being here. For those of you who are new to the Tree Stuff webinars, to uh, me, let me give you a quick little bit of background. Uh, my name is Craig Bachman. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I lived on the East Coast. I lived in the Rocky Mountains in Denver for 15 years, and I've been here in Seattle for five years. If you haven't been to Seattle, come check it out. This is a super cool place with big trees and some really challenging work sites. Uh, I've been an arborist for about a decade now. I'm a certified arborist, qualified tree risk assessor, CTSP, Certified Tree Care Safety Professional through TCIA. Uh, I'm a certified uh, tree worker, climber specialist, uh, safety trainer. I carry an OSHA 30 card. I've done a bunch of things just to learn as much as I possibly can. I've had the opportunity to work down in California in the safety roles on some of the big projects there. I've gotten to climb in a bunch of states. I've done a bunch of cool things, but none of that matters. None of that matters. It's all what we do with the experience and what we do with the knowledge that we have. So let's move forward on that. And let's start sharing some knowledge back and forth. And please send in your questions. Let's answer them as best we can. I appreciate you being here. Let's talk about chainsaws and cutting. First thing, one, this is uh, skills for professional operators. This is not for homeowners. This is not for recreational users, people who might be cutting a little bit of firewood. This is for men and women out in the field working in tree care operations. Number two, read the operator's manual. There's all kinds of things I'll share with you. Every time I get a new tool, I try to read the operator's manual, whether it's a chainsaw or a carabiner. There's something new to learn in there and take responsibility for your own knowledge and safety. Read the operator's manual on your equipment. Number three, we're talking about chainsaw use in an urban or suburban scenario. The skills that we're gonna talk about today are intended for tree workers, arborists working in urban and suburban settings. Certainly they do apply out in the woods, but this is not a logging skills training. We're talking about working around houses, working around roadways, maybe working around power lines, pedestrians, cats and dogs, women and children, all the targets that could be a challenge on our job sites. So keep that in mind. When we're talking about this, we're talking about an urban forestry application. All right, 
So let's get into some safety fundamentals first, and then I want to play you a cool, cool video that we made. So chainsaw, PPE. Before doing anything with a chainsaw, I want to be sure that one, I've got gloves on. Anytime I'm going to be handling that chain, whether it's sharpening, doing maintenance, heck, doing a demo and doing training, I want to be sure that I have protection for my hands. These happen to be cut resistant gloves, leather gloves, whatever it is, make sure you have something on your hands. I'm going to grab a stump here real quick. Let's, let's talk chainsaws. Can you all see that? Yeah, I think you can. So every chainsaw has some basic safety features. And there's one that I want to talk about with battery saws. Best thing you can do when servicing the saw, sharpening the saw, handling the saw, when you're not going to cut, take the battery out. Something I've learned about battery saws is they don't make very much noise. And they don't make any noise at all when you're not pulling the trigger. So if you're going to handle that saw without cutting, take the battery out. Two, there are some critical safety features in here that apply to gas and battery powered chainsaws. And I want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Number one is chain break and making sure that chain break is functioning properly. This chain break is designed specifically for this size saw, both its physical size and its power. So you can't interchange a chain break. You want the saw, if you have to replace a part, you want the chain break designed for that saw. So that's one safety feature. Second safety feature on the back of the saw is the chain catch pin or chain catcher. This needs to be in place. If you throw a chain, or I should say when you throw a chain, because we've all done it, when you throw a chain, this catches that chain and stops its movement and prevents it from swinging back and hitting you. Related to that is the hand guard here in the back of the saw, this wider portion on the bottom of the handle. If and when that chain would get thrown, it's caught in the catch pin and it'll swing back and it may hit the bottom of the saw. So making sure that that uh, hand guard part of the handle is intact, it's not broken, protects your hand when you're operating the saw. Next safety feature up on top here is the throttle interlock. It's probably not actually the technical term for it on a battery saw, but on a gas saw, we call it a throttle interlock. The intention is until this is depressed, you cannot press the throttle trigger. So I have to depress this and I need to make sure that that interlock is functioning properly before I use the saw. There's one more safety feature that is not on this saw. It is the uh, spark arrester. You can imagine why a battery saw doesn't have a spark arrester. Let's grab one that does. So this is my 550, another one of my favorite saws. Up here under the chain brake, there's a little screen in the muffler that catches any errant sparks that would come out, helps prevent a fire on the job site particularly important when you're working out in the woods, working in dry climates. But the fact is that the spark arrester and every other safety feature on these saws needs to be in place before you operate the saw. These are manufacturer designed and required safety features. Not having any one of these, first, it exposes you to a much greater potential for injury. And two, it's against the law. Operating equipment, that is missing required safety features, manufacturer safety features is against the law according to the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And you could be cited through OSHA. Will it come up? Well, it could on an inspection, it could after an accident, but most importantly, just don't go there. Don't put yourself at risk by operating saw without these safety features in place. All right. Let's talk about readying your saw for work. Most important thing, nah, let's not say it that way. Something I see regularly is operators using saws without the chain properly tensioned. And how do you know it's not properly tensioned? I'll tell you what, I'm surprised the number of times I watch somebody up in a tree or cutting on a ground and you can see the chain droop and you can see light between the bar and the chain it's clearly not tensioned properly. It's clearly not tensioned properly. We're not gonna go through a whole chain tensioning skill here, but 
the basics of it are loosen the bar nut, tension the chain, tighten it up again, and make sure that the bar tip is elevated. Or if you want to be really clever, flip the saw upside down when you do it because it puts the bar in the right orientation. Adjust that chain, tension the bar nut, and you're ready to go. All right. So let's see. Other safety things we should talk about. Oh, let's talk about PPE. So we're going to do some cutting today. So I'm wearing all of my PPE. We talked about gloves previously. I like cut resistant gloves. I'll tell you, I don't wear them all the time, but anytime I'm really handling that chain a lot, sharpening in particular, gloves are really important. Cut resistant ones, even better. Got my helmet on. I've got my ear protection. I'll probably knock out my earpiece using this at some point. I've got my ear protection. I've also got my visor. And I guarantee at some point in this webinar, I'm going to forget to put my visor down. So I'll do my very best. When we're out in the field, I ask my crew that if we see one of us cutting without a visor down, just flip the visor down. Is it required? Depends on your job site. Depends on where you're working. But the fact is, nobody likes sawdust in the face. So I like cutting with my visor. I find it really helpful. It's great when working around in the brush too. I don't like getting stabbed in the face any more than you do. All right. I've got my high vis on here. That's a requirement at my company, Tree133. Uh, I've got my leg protection on. I happen to prefer saw pants. There's all kinds of different brands. These Husky technical pants I find uh, comfortable in terms of their fit. They're a little warm in the summer, but for working on the ground, these are my favorite pants. Uh, so saw protective pants, and you'll notice this is the label you're looking at back here. I want to be clear. You'll notice I have my label here, and it shows a UL that UL stamp represents that it is tested by the underwriter's laboratory to meet all the required standards. So having proper leg protection on. Quick thought about leg protection. Read the operator's manual or the instructions for it. And what you'll see in there is something that is often missed. And that is wash your leg protection. Whether it's chaps or saw pants, wash it. Don't wash it in mom's washing machine, though. Go to the laundromat. Wash it in accordance with their instructions. But the fact is, over time, dirt, bar oil, maybe fuel could get on these, and it mats down the protective layers, and they don't work as well. So keep your uh, leg protection clean, and it will provide the best protection it can for you. All right. And then let's see if we can do this. Boots. Got my boots. I happen to have a pair of chainsaw protective boots on here. They're not required. They're not required, but they are great to have. Some projects will require them. For us, what the Z says, the ANSI Z133, is over the ankle lace up boots. I like these saw boots. They're comfortable to stand in. These are Mindel Airstreams. I don't know if you can get them anymore here in the States, but I think you can order them from the UK. They're great. They're comfortable, chainsaw protective. Why not do the best we can to be safe, particularly if we're going to do a lot of cutting? All right. So, Without any further ado, hey, Kale, would you play that first video for us? Hey, Kale, is our video working right? No, I don't hear anything. I think we had a little technical difficulty there. Would you give us one more try? I want to try to get this played for you properly because we put a lot of effort into making it and I think you're going to enjoy it. Your audio is out of sync, Kale. This is this is how it goes live. 
if anybody else wants to do live webinars, it's pretty fun, isn't it? We're having a good time. Hey, welcome, we'll everybody. A difficult. We're here at Evergreen Washelli Memorial Park in North Seattle, Washington. Greetings to you, wherever you are. <laughs> I don't know what time of day it is where you are, and I don't know what time of day it is when we're showing this, but uh, it's good to have you all here I can with hear us. it fine. And thanks for the opportunity to be with you. And I want to acknowledge uh, the Evergreen Washelli team and the opportunity they have afforded us to come out here and do some cutting and shoot this video. Uh, we do a lot of work with the uh, cemetery management team here dealing with hazard trees, helping them with tree risk assessment. Uh, behind us, you can see a row of birch trees. Here in Seattle, the bronze birch borer is really decimating our birch population, particularly Betula pendula, the European white birch. Uh, the trees behind us have been, uh, I'll use the word pruned, to remove deadwood, to mitigate the hazard by other companies. And uh, we're out here today to shoot, primarily to shoot this video, but we're gonna help them remove a few of these trees all the way to the ground while we're here. So a big thank you again to Evergreen with Shelley and thanks to all of you for joining us and let's do some cutting. Stand clear, face cut. Kale's my mic live. Hey, hey, I think we're back. I think that video played properly. That was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as a quick aside, my company here in Seattle, Tree 133, uh, is really a tree preservation company. So I don't get to do a lot of felling here in town. Uh, that's mostly been on other projects. We do it occasionally. Oh, it's such a good time. <laughs> felling trees is actually a really fun challenge. And it's something we're going to talk about today. So I'm Again, I'm really excited about this subject. So let's talk about some fundamentals of chainsaw handling, and then we're going to dig deeper into individual skills. One of the things that I often see that goes uh, maybe missed in chainsaw handling is this part here. I don't know if you can see this digit that I'm holding up, but this thumb, making sure that our thumbs are wrapped, right? This is a two-handed tool doesn't matter whether you're operating a top handle saw or you're operating a battery saw or what do I have? I got my 390 back here where well, you got the 390 with a 40 inch bar on it. We're going to wrap our thumbs. It doubles our grip strength. 
It gives us much more control over the saw, and that applies to both our front handle, the wrap handle with our left hand, and the rear handle wrapping our thumb with the right hand and making sure that we have the maximum amount of control. And let's be really clear, control is what this is all about. The ability to do what we intend with a chainsaw is the point of this whole thing. And the more control you have, the more likely you are to put that saw exactly where you intend it. And let's not uh, miss the opportunity to say it again. This is a two-handed tool. So is this. Whether we're dealing with a top handle saw or a rear handle saw like we just had, this is a two-handed tool. A two-handed tool. It's extremely important. The potential to be injured by a chainsaw due to dangerous behaviors, particularly using it with one hand, is very real. And I don't want any of you to get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to hear about it. So let's all do the best we can to one, hold ourselves to a high standard, and two, hold those around us to a high standard. So we all go home at the end of the day. So two hands on the saw, wrapping our thumbs gives us the best control. And with our hands on the saw, we're not giving it the uh, squeeze the juice out of it grip. This is a nice relaxed grip that we're using in the saw. It enables us to put the saw where we intend it, to have a lot of control, and to keep our hands and forearms relaxed and in good condition. So we don't get either cramped up, we don't get carpal tunnel syndrome, we don't have all these other kinds of things that can impact our performance and impact our health in the long term. So two hands on the saw, please. Let's talk about body position. Body position with a chainsaw is extremely important. It's extremely important in the sense that one, it enables us to do what we intend. Two is it keeps us safe in doing that. And three, it reduces the amount of energy we use. We've all seen you know, the young saw operator leaning over at funny angles, lifting the saw high, cutting down low. Partway through the day, they're walking around like, like grandma or grandpa because their back is sore. They're learning the hard way the importance of body position. And the core of body position, hey, there's a play on words. The core of body position is our power zone. And you'll hear me use that term. The power zone is from our thighs to our chest. And what that means is that we have the greatest control of the saw, we have the best strength, and we use our body to its best advantage when we are operating the saw in that zone, in that power zone, between our chest and our thighs. And whether we are cutting with the saw upright or it's rolled over on its side, we want to keep in that power zone. So if we have to cut lower, how do we do that? That's pretty simple, really. We just bend our knees, right? What else could we do? Hey, Kale, let's flip over to that other camera for a second. Are you over here with me, bud? All right. So this is kind of fun shooting with two cameras. I feel like I'm on a movie set or something. But you'll notice what I did is I kneeled down. If I need to make a face cut down low, if I'm gonna bore, if I'm bucking wood, you'll notice my right knee goes down because my right hand goes down. And we're gonna see a little bit of that in a minute. But you'll notice that as the saw is in my hand, I'm still in my power zone. I'm not using my back to an inordinate level. I'm playing to the strengths of my own physiology and gonna let the saw do the work. So by kneeling down or bending our knees, we're able to put ourselves in the right cutting position rather than doing this. Oh my gosh. So uncomfortable, we've all seen it happen. And also we're not doing this, uh-uh. We've all seen that. All right, so don't go anywhere. I'm gonna bring another saw back. Let's talk briefly about top handle saws versus rear handle saws and what they're good at. Handle saw, sometimes called the climbing saw. Whoop, there's a loose chain for you. Good example, right? Top handle saw. Climbing saw is great up in the tree because it is a shorter tool. It's easier to maneuver. I can get closer or be closer into my work. A rear handle tool requires a little bit more room. 
I could certainly use a rear handle up in the tree. There's plenty of times when I do, often on uh, jobs that require cutting larger wood, either in a pruning or removal application. But a top handle was designed for use in the tree. A rear handle is best for use on the ground. And let me show you why. If this log is laying on the ground, let's do that. If this log is on the ground, this is why my wife asked me to put a piece of plywood on the deck. If this log's on the ground and I need to buck it up, if I use a rear handle saw, what does it require me to do? Or imagine I'm limbing it. It puts me that much closer to the work. Uh-uh, bad idea. I end up leaning right over the nose of the bar. My nose over that nose, bad news. So let's talk about this term of kickback. Kickback or rotational kickback is when the chain is passing over the nose of the bar on this saw. And I don't know if you can see it, if I come in real close, when the chain and cutting tooth passes over the nose of the bar, it exposes more of that cutting tooth rather than it being protected by the depth gauge. So it takes this big bite of a sudden and sticks in the wood or can stick in the wood. Then all of a sudden, the saw kicks back. It rotates inside of the chain rather than the chain around the bar. And that kickback is a huge risk that we need to prevent through good handling of a chainsaw, through proper handling of a chainsaw. So if we use or were to use a rear handle, excuse me, a top handle saw on the ground, it puts us more at risk because we are closer to the bar. We have less control because our hands are closer together. In comparison with a rear handle saw, you see how my hands are separated? I have more control of the saw. I can be farther from my work. So working on the ground, a rear handle saw is the way to go. Some companies will even call this a ground saw and the other one a climbing saw for exactly that reason. All right, Kale, let's go back the other way. All right, so rear handle versus top handle. Rear handle versus top handle. They have their purposes. And I like the saying that uh, Mark Bridge, uh, formerly with Tree Imagineers, used to use, which is we want to use tools in a way that is fit for purpose. And on the ground, cutting with a rear handle is the best tool to be fit for purpose. So we've talked about safety features. We've talked about body position and power zone. Let's talk about some tools that you may have seen in the video. When we're felling, when we're bucking, two really important tools an ax and a wedge. You're gonna see that here in a moment. And you'll notice this is not a very big ax, but that's all we really need. And I'll tell you how I've learned this. What I've learned is that if you're in a position where you think a bigger ax is gonna solve the problem, think again about your plan. Because if you start getting a bigger and bigger ax and swinging that thing harder and harder to drive wedges, something is wrong and the ax is not likely to solve it. We're not using the tool of the wedge to our greatest advantage. And that's gonna come down to using proper hinge technique. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. All right, so ax and wedge, what else do we have? First aid kit, either within reach or on the job site, depending on where you are. On some projects, like down in California, many of the fellers will carry a first aid kit on their belt along with a fire extinguisher. We happen to have our first aid kit and fire extinguisher on the table here. We keep them in the truck on our job sites here in the city. All right, one more tool, a whistle. <laughs> I'm not gonna blow this whistle. It's really, really loud and that's the point. If something goes wrong and I'm in the backyard and my crew's in the front yard, maybe there's another machine going, maybe there's work happening next door, maybe somebody else is bucking wood and I get hurt and I need to get their attention, this whistle is my best friend. This whistle will cut through the noise of other tools and get the attention of my crew when there's an emergency. So out on the job site, first aid kit, fire extinguisher, ax and wedges, and a whistle. Right on. All right, so in the process of felling a tree, we put the tree on the ground, 
we limit, and then we bucket. In the process of a webinar, we're going to do it in the other order. So because we're limited on time today, we're going to talk about bucking, then we're going to talk about felling. We just don't have time to get into too much more than that. So, Kale, if you would, please, would you play that bucking video for us? So we've got our birch here on the ground and we need to buck it up so we can move it out of the roadway. So in many situations, we can just make a through cut. We don't have to worry about a lot of tension and compression. In our case, the tree's rotten, it's broken out beyond me. I just need to make a clean cut in the wood. So I'm gonna do that right now. Come on around this side. I want you to see where the power head of the saw is. You can see that I'm keeping the saw parallel to the ground and the power head's gonna go down first before the tip of the bar. I wanna make sure I don't ground or rock that bar. So let's finish the cut. And I don't know if you were able to hear that, but I feathered the saw as I was finishing the cut, rather than cutting through at full speed and having what we call follow through, where you have pressure from your hands, a fast cutting saw and the tip continues, I feathered it so it just nibbled away and let the wood drop away without the bar continuing beyond the cut. So, a simple through cut for bucking. All right, so our tree's on the ground. We need to finish up our bucking here. Wedges, some of the most important, simple and inexpensive tools you can have. Let's look at how we can use a wedge to lift the wood and make our cut without putting the bar and chain into the ground. So here we go. Notice that every time I take my hands off the saw, I'm engaging that chain break. Let's not have running saws with free, free running chains. That's a great way to improve safety on the job site. Can you see how as I'm driving this wedge, it's opening the gap between the pieces and lifting it slightly more off the ground, giving me a little more room to cut. making sure I still have room to operate my saw underneath, I'll finish the cut. All right, chain breaks on, saws off, piece is cut. So in some bucking situations, we have uh, tension created or compression created in the wood. In this instance, we're kind of on a little bit of a rise toward the stump, and we're sitting here on this concrete curb. And that's creating compression in the top of the wood. A less experienced sawyer would be likely to start cutting from the top and get the bar pinched. You've probably experienced that before. I know I have. So let me show you a technique that you can use to handle that. One option that we'll do in a minute is to use a wedge, but in this instance, we're going to use a bore cut, a little bit like we did in felling. The concept is we're going to cut a little bit away at the top, Pull the saw back and bore underneath and leave almost a hinge or strap in the middle and then we'll cut that away at the end. Let me show you what that looks like. So, 
using that bore cut technique, we were able to manage the compression created in the top of the wood using one slightly more complex cut, but something that I think would be well within your abilities with a little bit of practice. So we've got our birch. Hey, there we go. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I got you, Kale. Good. All right. Perfect. So I've got a couple questions here. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the comment section. Hey, Kale, buddy, you've got yeah. Hold on. How about now? Ooh. Beautiful. Better? Okay. Sounds Good. lovely. Perfect. Um, yeah, okay. So, some, uh, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them uh, in the comment section here. Uh, I'll try to give any uh, sort through them uh, with what he's going to talk about later on. Um, but the so first one here is protective gloves. Um, I've got, oh, I started writing his name down. Someone on the YouTube comment section asked about this. Philip Jacobs um, asked, uh, protective gloves for chainsaws have fibers that pull free and jam the sprockets. Other cut resistant gloves have fibers that do not, that, that don't cut like that. Couldn't these pull a user's hand into the moving chain? That's a great question. Yeah, Philip, thank you very much for an excellent question. And let's clarify a little bit. These are cut resistant gloves. These are intended to protect my hands from sharp objects such as a handsaw, a pocket knife, chainsaw chain when I'm sharpening it. These are not chainsaw protective gloves. They're intended to give me an added layer of protection over a simple pair of, let's say, hardware store gloves, but they are not intended to be chainsaw protective. So going farther with your question, um, could a pair of gloves pull my hand into the saw? I guess theoretically, yes. And so let me share with you my quick thought on how to prevent that. And it goes back to our safety features, right? And you probably know what the answer is. Anytime we're done cutting, that chainsaw goes on. And I think you heard me maybe mention in that video, anytime that one hand or the other comes off the saw, chainsaw break goes on. That way we ensure that we are never putting our hands anywhere near a moving chain. Thank you, Philip, for an awesome question and a great opportunity to clarify. Okay. Kale, what else do we have? Um, I've got another one here, ear protection with the uh, battery powered saws. Um, are, yeah. what, what's, what, what are the rules there? So I'm not going to be able to quote you the decibels number because I don't know them off my head. But what I want to share with you is experience. A battery saw is not silent, right? It's not a stealth chainsaw, but how cool would that be? No, a battery <laughs> saw definitely makes plenty of noise. It just makes a very different kind of noise. But I want to share with you a really important difference. It doesn't make any noise when you're not cutting. So let's do a quick live demonstration here. And Kale, keep the audio up. I want yep. to run this real quickly and everybody be able to hear. All right. Chainsaw's on. Ready to cut. It's not making any noise. It's not making any noise at all. Now I'm going to cut. I take my finger off the trigger, hit the chain break. It's not making any noise. If I'm up in the tree, it's hanging on my harness. If I'm in the bucket, it's in the scabbard. If I'm on the ground, I'm ready to cut. I'm done cutting. It doesn't make any noise. The biggest difference that I've found is there's no idling noise. I don't know if you can see that the green bars and the red light flashing. That's telling me the saw is on, but there's no sound at all. So let's do a comparison just so we all are on the same page. This is my 550, one of my other favorite saws. Definitely gas powered. I have not started this today, so let's see how we do. So 
I'm just gonna keep talking here. The saw is idling. I'm not doing anything. This is where the noise difference takes place. That's why I leave the gas saw in the truck whenever I can. I love this thing. This 550 yeah. is amazing. But I don't want to listen to it. So when I don't need it, the gas saw stays in the truck. Maybe I'll make a few cuts toward the end of the day. Maybe it's an all gas saws day. It depends on what it is. But I've learned, and relative to the question, the big difference in noise is when the saw is idling. A battery saw, no idling noise. But it does make noise when it's cutting. And some people find the noise just as irritating, just as a different pitch. It always reminds me a little bit of a dentist drill. But I tell you what, it cuts like a dream. And I'm willing to put up with a little noise for that. All right. What else do we have? Okay. Um... Uh, I, are you, I assume you're going to be getting into. Are you going to get into the Humboldt versus conventional uh, undercuts later on? So we will in just a couple minutes. Okay. Yep. Um, well, then going to Dennis Ramey. Uh, there's a little bit of a discussion on YouTube going on over standing versus kneeling. Um, the the idea being that when you're kneeling, you don't have as much. Your reaction time is increased. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Ooh. Awesome. And Dennis, good to see you on here, man. Thanks for joining us. Great question. Let's go over to our, uh, our other camera here and let's talk about it with a demo. Rawr. All right. So I think what Dennis is getting at is if I am standing, making my face cut and bore cut, or I am kneeling, or with the other knee, kneeling, is there a pro or con to one of those over the other? I'm not a scientist, I'm not a ergonomics expert, but in my experience, I like standing up. In a logging setting, now I'm speaking out of school, but I'll share with you my impression. In a logging setting, the goal is to maximize usable, scalable board feet. And about a Humboldt versus a lower face hold notch. Up. Hold up. The low cut in the tree. Can you hear me? Say again, Kale. Um, you're starting to yeah, cut I out got a little you. bit. Is your where's your mic pack? Oh, is it on the back side here? It might be. There we go. That sounds better. Is that better. All right. Yeah. Sorry. I guess I'm very dense. You're fine. <laughs> we're, when we're trying to maximize board feet. Yeah, exactly. When we're trying to maximize board feet on a tree that we're falling in a logging setting, the goal is to cut as low as possible and to not put a big face in the usable wood, in the saleable wood. So that's where the Humboldt notch comes from because it turns it upside down. And I think that's often where kneeling comes from because it puts my cut lower. In an arborist scenario, when I'm working in someone's yard, I'm gonna cut where I can make the best possible cut where I'm most comfortable and I can most effectively go down my escape route once that tree is free and ready to move. So excellent question, standing versus kneeling. That's my perspective on it. Be wide open to anybody else uh, chiming in. But let's move on to another subject. I'm going back to the other camera, Kale. Okay. Uh, it's do all you Hollywood get... here. This is <laughs> I know, right? Um... Do you want to get started on the uh, next section? We're at about we're about yeah. Uh, let's get into in. spelling. We're about yeah. We're coming up on midway, so let's do this. We're going to transition a little bit. We saw some bucking there, which was cutting on the ground. And let's just briefly summarize. We talked about through cutting a log when the end maybe is suspended or when there's no tension or compression. We talked about or showed demonstration of using an axe and a bucking wedge to lift the log off the ground so that we could finish our cut without grabbing the saw. Some people call that rocking the saw. I kind of like that saying. Axe and a wedge, awesome tools for bucking. And then we also talked about that cut relative to making the top cut and then boring underneath, leaving a strap in the middle that creates a hinge point and enables us to manage tension and compression in a log on the ground. 
that's a great tool. It's a great tool. So three different bucking techniques that you can use. And uh, Kale, am I correct that this webinar is being recorded? Right on. Yes, this webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, you'll be able to watch this at any point in time. Um, I just did a weird transition there on accident. Sorry. Uh, and I caught myself off guard. Um, yeah, you'll be able to watch this in point in time <laughs> and do the, uh, the, the quiz for the CEUs. Um, when you're watching this live, so right now the people I'm talking to, not the people in the future, uh, you'll get uh, two CEUs for a passing quiz uh, grade. If you do it when you if you watch the recorded version and then take a seat the the quiz, you'll only get one CEU. So uh, good job, awesome. everyone who's here. Um, everyone in the future. Um, sorry, that's that's how the rules are with uh, the ISA. So. Back Pretty amazing you. that we can talk to the future. How cool. <laughs> All right. So where I'm going with that is this is recorded. You can go back and watch those video segments showing those bucking techniques. You can share those with other people as well. All right. So, Kale, if you're ready, let's get into felling part one. Let's go ahead and play that video. All right, so when we're gonna fell a tree, first thing we have to do is assess our heights, hazards, our leans, our sight. We've gone through all of that. We've got a nice drop zone ahead of us and uh, we know where the tree's gonna go. Fortunately for us, it's got a really good positive lean. So we just need to put in a nice clean set of cuts. Face cut, our back cut to set up our hinge, a trigger in the back. So let's talk about the face cut first. One of the most important things for making the face cut is to remember this. We need to make an open face cut. And when I say open, what we mean is a 7 degree, 70 degree angle or greater. 70 or greater. The importance of that is it allows the tree to travel more than half the way to the ground before the hinge closes and breaks. So 70 degree angle or greater. Secondly, the direction of our cut. It's really facilitated by an important tool on your chainsaw that you may or may not be familiar with. It's called the felling sights. You'll see the black line that runs up and over the top of my saw. That is perpendicular to the bar, and that points in the direction of my cut. This is designed to help you put that face cut in exactly where you intend it. So let's go ahead and start this face cut, and you'll see how I use that tool. me several times get down behind the saw looking over that felling site yep just about in line there that tells me where my cut is aimed so using that felling site and checking it as you're in the middle of your cut making sure you haven't pulled the saw offline particularly if you have a tree with gnarled bark or an unusual shape it's really easy to pull the saw out of line so you saw me check part way through my cut to make sure it was aimed where I anticipated it next you'll notice I got my 70 degree angle here and that I made the top cut first. I'm going to use that to help line up my bottom cut. So let's go ahead and do that. Right. 
So I'm in the middle of making my bottom cut. Why don't you come around and see how the cuts connect on the opposite side of the tree. I think it'll make sense why I made the top cut first. When I'm making this bottom cut now, I can look down through my top cut and I can see the bar closing and I can see it lined up here at that far corner. This is the hardest part of the, cut, part of the cut to see. And by making my top cut first, I give myself a window through to see that alignment. So why don't you watch as this finishes. Come on in close here. By looking through that top cut, and having my bar horizontal, I could easily line up both corners and end up with a clean hinge and a clean face cut almost every time. Certainly, it's possible to miss and you clean it up a little bit, but making that face cut, starting with the top, makes it so much easier to hit your target the first time. All right, so All right, welcome back. I really enjoyed doing those videos and uh, Kayla and I were talking the background and uh, I'm so glad we shot them that way so that we could have an environment where you can really see cutting on full size trees. We're gonna do a little bit on some of our bolts here. I wanted you to see that and us be able to talk in detail. So let's review a couple of things from that video. Uh, our face notch miniature right face notch here top cut bottom cut and the key point i want you to take away from this is the openness of this angle and we're going to look at a couple examples here in just a second and talk about alternatives and pros and cons but the openness of this angle here we go ready boom feeling all clever here because i wrote that number ahead of time so a 70 degree angle or greater ensures that the face cut stays open and the hinge stays intact through more than half of the trees travel. That hinge is what gives you control over direction. Once the face closes and that hinge is broken, you lose control of the tree and Mr. Gravity takes over. So 70 degree angle is what provides 70 or greater provides you the maximum control that's described as a technical tree cut felling face cut again this isn't logging we're going to talk about that in a minute and some differences but 70 degree angle i want to share another number with you Ooh, there we go it stayed on my push pin 80 percent of the width of the tree when we are judging the depth of our face cut you'll often hear oh a ratio of the tree a certain amount of depth whatever it might be the best guideline is that we're looking for 80 percent of the width 80 percent of the width of the tree represented by our face notch and the hinge behind it so not a hundred percent 80 percent and that will typically work out to be about a quarter to a third of the depth so let's look at that from this side again we're somewhere in that one quarter to one third depth represented by a hinge, a face cut that is 80% the width of the total diameter of the trunk. All right, so let's compare some felling cuts and let's talk about how we use the saw to make those. In the video, we talked about the felling sites. I want to flip this saw so you can see it. Up on top of this saw, in behind the handle, you can see this black line. This black line wraps all the way around the top and sides of the saw. I guess it's silver here on the, uh, on the uh, cover plate. But you saw me as I was behind the tree, get down behind that saw, looking over the top of it. 
looking at my target. The spelling sites are designed to make your job easier. They're designed to make felling the tree as accurate and as simple as possible. Use those tools. I'll tell you what, nobody explained that to me when I first got into this profession. It took a couple of years and some good training before I realized the purpose of that and how to use it. So felling sites make your job easier. All right. And so once we know where the tree is intended to go, we have to be sure that we're considering the lean, the side lean, forward, forward lean, and back lean. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what we have time for today, but don't forget to look at the tree. It may influence or it will influence where you send it, where your landing zone is. So let's assume we've made those decisions. We've looked at hazards. We've looked at lean. We know we have enough room. We've measured the height of the tree. We're going to make a face cut. Let's talk about what kind of face cut we might make. I'm going to move my demo over here. Let's see if I can do this without dropping it. Ready? Did anybody ever watch Sesame Street? I feel like the guy who carried around Oscar the Grouch. I don't, I don't, know, what, uh, I don't know what that guy's name was. I'm looking at my wife over here. He was, a, he was a garbage man, and I think he wore orange. But anyway, let's see if we can turn this so we can see. Yeah. All right. We can see pretty well in here. So up at the top, we have our 70-degree open face notch for technical tree felling. See, if I get out of the way of it, you can see it with a dark background. Oh, there we go. 70 degrees. And I will tell you, 70 degrees is more open than you think it is. So when you go to practice these notches, you cut it more open than you think. More open than you think. And I guess reiterating the point, practice on some bolts like this. Don't, don't practice on full-size trees in some nice lady's yard. Practice on some bolts back at the wood lot in your shop. Get good at these before you use them on the job site. So here's our 70 degree notch. In comparison here, we have our 45 degree notch. The big difference in these is the travel, the distance that the tree travels before that face notch closes. And that's the big point. A 70, 70 degree notch allows the tree to travel farther before the face closes and we break the hinge compared to a 45 degree compared to a 45 degree. And there was a question that came in, and I'm sorry, I don't know who it was from. We'll do more questions here in just a second. So if you have them, send them in. Somebody asked about a Humboldt notch, which is an upside down 45 degree. Sometimes these are called conventional and Humboldt notches. They're roughly 45 degrees. Like we talked about earlier, the Humboldt notch is designed to maximize board feet so that you're not cutting a face into the usable wood. The face is cut downward into the stump effectively. So what we're gonna talk about and what I would like to see you use for most precision, accuracy, and safety in your tree felling is an open face notch, 70 degrees or greater. If you need to, you could lower this bottom cut, take it to 90 degrees, maybe take it to 120 degrees, depending on the situation. It's certainly doable, but make that 70 degrees or greater your target, and that will give you the maximum control over trees that you're felling. All right, Kale, let's go to a few questions here. All right, so we're putting my face back in here. Um, oh, you should hear me twice. Everyone else can hear me. There you go. So uh, a couple questions. Um, uh, how about, uh, we'll get into that. Um, when you're doing a face cut on small trees, small diameter trees, uh, how does that change anything with your sot with your eighty percent? Um, because if you do it too far, you can't get a yeah. wedge in. Or what's what's the the idea? Great there? question. Great question. As the diameter of the tree gets smaller, we start to run out of room. What we're going to talk about in a minute with our back cut is using a bore cut to increase uh, our accuracy with our hinge and to improve safety. 
But it, the face cut and the bore cut become more and more challenging as the tree gets smaller. And so the depth of the face relative to the diameter of the trunk and the width of the face, really the width of the hinge, those percentages, those ratios stay the same on small trees. We just have a smaller margin for error. We have to be more careful. And I'll tell you something that I've learned. This is a really, really good question. Something that I've learned is on a smaller tree, use a smaller saw. And why do I say that? If I, uh, if I pull out my 390 and I'm going to cut a, uh, let's see, I'm going to fell an 8-inch birch or a 10-inch hemlock, whatever it might be, a 40-inch bar on a 390, I'm going to cut right through that thing. My ability to be precise and to be accurate on a small tree, it really goes down. So instead, don't use the big saw. Use a smaller saw. Maybe I'll go to my battery saw. Maybe I'll go to my 540 IXP. Smaller bar, lighter, more precise. So choosing an appropriately sized saw for the tree that you're working on. And in a minute, we're going to talk about bore cut versus traditional back cut. Remind me, Kale, I'm looking at you, buddy. Remind me when we're going to talk about this question again. So excellent question. And okay. the answer is the ratios, the percentages stay the same. We just have to be more precise because those uh, increments are smaller. Excellent gotcha. question. Smaller saw is also, yeah, good idea. Um, all right. Uh, the other one here, um, when you're doing a face cut um, or your, your notch, um, how, does anything change if you've got a tree that has rot or an extreme lean? I know you said you weren't going to get into Ooh, the lean very much. Question. Yeah. So let's talk about trees that could be considered hazards. Tree with an extreme lean, side lean, or forward and back lean can be a hazard in and of itself, regardless of the tree's health structural integrity. So managing lean is a subject of its own. Once the center of mass is more than five feet outside the trunk, watch out, watch out. And let's call that a very general guideline. But when you stand back and you look at the tree and you look at where the center of mass is, when that is more than five feet outside the trunk, watch out. There's a whole bunch of leverage on your hinge and it becomes a much more complex scenario. When you have decay in the tree, absolutely becomes more complex. Making sure that your hinge is in good quality wood. And the question is, what if it isn't? What if the tree is so decayed? The answer is it's a much more complex tree. And I don't mean to avoid the question, but the conversation around this is going to go way deeper than we have time for. Mm -hmm. What we're going to talk about today are techniques to use on solid sound wood. But when you're talking about something that's dead, decayed, strange, unusual, excessive lean or unusual structure, it gets much more complex. And when in doubt, step back. Get someone else to look at it. Nobody was ever wrong by backing off of a tree and getting another opinion, bringing in more help. But you could be wrong when you put the saw into that hazard tree. So excellent question. Thank you for asking. I uh, Right on. Yeah, oh, that... Oh, go ahead. No, I was I was just going to say that that is actually uh, the webinar, the chainsaw webinar we did with Tim Ard, is more is more focused on that um, than 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 this one is. So if you're interested in uh, talking about those super hazardous trees um, and, and doing that, uh, go check that out. It does get very technical. Um, uh, t -t 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 Great. Sorry. Uh, the other All one. Right, let's continue. Uh, do you want to continue with the questions? Or do you want to continue with uh, your? Felon? Let's hold on the question. Let's okay. Hold on the question. Let's get to making the bore cut, making our back cut, because that's going to pull in face and hinge and back cut. And I think we have questions coming up around yes. that subject. 
Yeah. So let's roll with uh, felling part two. Perfect. All right. And I'll get the dog's squeaky toy out of here so no one hears that. All right. So we've made our face cut. We've got clean corners. And we've checked our aim using our felling sights to know that this cut is aimed in exactly where we intend it. So our next step is to make a back cut. A traditional back cut, we're going to talk about later, it can be done, but I want to show you something that in many situations is a better choice, and that's a bore cut. It enables you to set up your hinge before cutting away that strap at the back of the tree. It increases safety, and it gives you a much greater margin for error because you can clean up your hinge a little bit, you can clean up your cut before releasing the tree. So, as I start this, I want you to watch my body position, how I engage the saw, I'm going to engage it at an angle and then pivot before boring into the tree. I think that'll be clear as you see it happen. So here we go. Come on in here close so you can see. You'll notice the bar of the saw is pointed away from the hinge. I'm not trying to set my hinge perfectly as I make the bore. I'm gonna give myself some room. I can always cut more. Secondly, if you can come in and watch my hand here, I've turned the saw on its side. I'm operating the throttle with my thumb as I'm boring. So my hand's in a more comfortable position rather than trying to turn it under the handle. So I'm operating it with my thumb, and I'm going to bore through till it comes out the back of the tree. I'm going to go check my alignment, and then I'll clean up the hinge. So here we go. on in here close where you can see. We bored through. We were on the same plane as our face notch and the corners of our hinge. And I've cut right up to where I had the desired amount of hinge remaining. And you'll notice that I took my time in doing that. I left it nice and thick, and worked my way in gradually. I know I have the other side set properly because I put it in there in the first place before coming around here. And all I needed to do was this backside. And I came around the back of the tree to make sure I could see it really well. It's the best way to make sure you get your hinge exactly the way you intended. All right. Right on. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, yeah, we got lots to talk about. Bore cutting is such a powerful technique. It's such a powerful technique. And as I think you heard me mention, using a bore cut on the back enables me to set up my hinge exactly the way I want it before releasing the tree. That's the biggest thing to know. It enables me to set up my hinge perfectly before releasing the tree as compared to a traditional back cut. If I've put my face in 
and I start back cutting the traditional way on the back of the tree, cutting toward the hinge, I am releasing this tree or I'm, a, I am nearly releasing this tree as I'm getting close to my hinge. And if my saw isn't lined up just right, if I have the tip down or I've wrapped the tip around, I could be too close to my hinge. I could be below it. I could be above it. And maybe I don't know it till the tree starts going the wrong way. And I'll tell you, learning to make a bore cut was a big change for me. Oh, what was it now? Maybe five or six years ago. What a difference it has made. Does it take some practice? Absolutely, but it's very doable. It's not nearly as hard as you think with a properly sharpened saw. Bore cut is a wonderful technique to be A, more accurate in setting up your hinge, and B, to improve safety. And I wanna talk about safety and fouling here for just a moment. One subject we haven't talked about so far is the idea of an escape route. Anytime we're felling a tree, we want to have at least one, if not two, routes to get away as soon as that tree is released. Because the last thing we want to be doing is up be standing up close to that stump as the tree is moving through the air. The proper escape route goes 45 degrees away from the stump, not directly back and not 90 degrees. Why is it that way? What research into felling accidents has found is that fellers are killed or injured when the tree goes sideways or goes back. I guess also when the tree goes forward and bounces. And so where the safest area to be is, is 45 degrees away. Think of it as over my shoulders, either direction away from the stump. So 45 degrees away, that's our escape route. And I wanna share a couple of numbers with you and maybe you've heard these before. 90, 15, five. And it's a simple way to remember. 90% of accidents involving the feller occur within the first 15 seconds of tree movement and within five feet of the stump. Let me say it one more time. 90% of accidents involving the feller occur within the first 15 seconds of tree movement and within five feet of the stump. So we can be much safer in our operations by one, getting away from the stump and two, staying away from the stump. And so how far do we have to go? That last number, that five, get at least five feet away from the stump. Farther is better. Farther is absolutely better, but get out of that immediate hazard zone. And two, when you can, go before the tree starts moving. And one of the tools we have that uh, is sort of beyond our scope today, but is the idea of installing a pull rope, installing a line in the tree where you can set up your cuts, leave a strap or a trigger in the back, which you'll see in a minute, and then Leave the area, go down your escape route before the tree movement is initiated with the pull rope. It's a great way to get away. So 90, 15, five. 90% of accidents with the feller occur within 15 seconds of tree movement and within five feet of the stump. So use your escape route, get away from the tree. You'll see me do that here in a minute. Secondly, a question came in that Kale mentioned to me during the video around starting saws. And let's, uh, let's go over to the other camera for a second, Kale. All right. So over here, if I'm going to start this saw, are you able to see my feet, Kale? Let's tip the camera down a little bit. When I'm going to start this saw, the safest and most secure way to do it is left hand on the wrap handle, making sure my chain breaks on. Right hand, excuse me, right foot through the rear handle. This gives me a lot of control over the saw. And then I can start it with my right hand. And what you'll see is all of these techniques use the right hand to pull the T-handle to start the saw. 
because that's how the saw is designed. If we're going to stand up with the saw, we use the leg lock technique. Let's go to the other camera. Over here, the leg lock technique. It's the rear handle of the saw is trapped kind of between my thighs. So I have really good control over the back. Left arm is straight, thumb wrapped around the front handle. And again, I can pull with my right arm. That's the way the saw is designed. And you'll see I've got the saw rolled over at an angle in my hand. It's not straight up and down. That way I'm pulling toward my right shoulder when I'm starting the saw. So whether I'm starting on the ground or I'm starting standing up, setting up with good control and to pull with my right hand. And what I found is sometimes it's mistaken for drop starting because as I've gotten really good with those techniques, for me to start the saw, I'll set my choke, my chain break. The saw starts pretty fast. It's not a drop start. The saw is secure between my thighs, held with my left hand, and I started it on one pull. Part of it's having a saw that's well-maintained. And the other, it's getting really solid with your technique. So whoever asked that question about drop starting, thank you very much. A great opportunity to clarify. All right. So bore cutting, one of my favorite subjects. What I'd like to do is do a demo of that again so you can see it and we can talk it through. You know me well enough now to know that my preference is for a battery saw because it's just so much quieter. And guess what I don't have to do? No pull starts. It's much easier on the shoulder, less vibration, less noise. And interestingly, what I've noticed is less fumes. I didn't really recognize how big a difference that made until I'd been running my battery saw for a while and then I went back to a gas saw for a bigger tree. Wow, the amount that I noticed the fumes was a lot more than I anticipated. All right, so let's go make a face cut, make a bore cut and talk about these in a little more detail. Let me get a few things together for us. All right. Kale, I'm gonna move my microphone to another pocket so we don't get caught again. All right, can you still hear me all right? All right, so you'll see I've got an ax stuck in the... <laughs> Kale had his microphone off. I've got an ax stuck in the top of this bolt. You'll hear me use that term. This isn't a full tree. <laughs> I can knock this thing over. So my, uh, my lovely assistant, also known as my wife and business partner, uh, Joanna is here. She's got her saw protection, ear protection on. She's going to hold on to the end of this four foot ax or whatever it is, three and a half feet, just to make sure I don't tip this thing over because it isn't attached to the ground. So let's go through what we've done so far. One is I picked my target based on the shape of the tree, the lean, the available landing zone. Second is made sure my area was clear, kept everyone away from my felling. We want to make sure that bystanders are at least two times the tree height away and that anyone involved in the felling other than the person running the saw is at least one and a half times away. That creates a good safe work zone. Now, I have my target. It's going to be right at the camera. I've got my saw. Oh, my chain's a little loose. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to tension my chain before I start this cut. If there's anything that you take away from this, maybe this point will make a difference for you. Make sure your saw is ready to cut before you start. Making a precision chainsaw cut when you're felling a tree requires a saw that's well maintained. I've been doing a bunch of cutting today with the saw already. I cut all the demo notches and whatnot. I want to make sure that I have the chain tightened properly. Let's see, loosen the bar nut, tighten the chain a little bit. Wearing my gloves. There we go, that feels about right. I'm gonna run it briefly. 
And really, what did I say earlier? Take the battery out before you touch the chain. Something I'm still working on for myself too. All right, so we're ready to cut. My target is right toward the camera. So I've got my felling sights. I'm gonna set up my aim with the tree, excuse me, with the saw up against the tree. And I'm looking right over the top of my felling sights, right at you. Saw's on, ready to go. Jojo, you ready? Ready. All right, so face notch, 70 degrees. All right, so good command and response. All right, face notch, stand clear. All clear. All clear for my crew, we're ready to go. Check the area. Here we go, face notch. I've started it, I'm gonna check again. I like it, now I'm gonna improve my position a little bit. You'll notice that I'm checking my line with my felling sights and I'm keeping the saw level. Probably the better way to say it is I'm keeping the saw perpendicular to the stem of the tree. If this tree had leaned to it, I would lean my face cut with it. Same if it came this way. This happens to be pretty vertical. I'm making my face cut perpendicular to the stem of the tree. So what am I looking for? 70 degrees, open face notch, and approximately 80% of the tree width. I'm gonna take a peek. Yeah, I need it more. So I don't think Kale's turned down the uh, the audio, so you're hearing what the saw sounds like. Does it make some noise? Absolutely. But right now, there's no noise when it's idling. There is no idle. It's dead quiet. Makes me pretty happy. I really like cutting with these newer high power battery saws. All right, so I've made my face notch, excuse me, my top cut and my face notch first. And why did I do that? You'll remember, I wanna be able to look through the top cut when I make my bottom cut. So let's do that. Starting on my side, lined up with the near corner. The saw is horizontal. The face cut, the top of the face cut was made finishing with the saw horizontal. What that means is it's gonna be much easier for me to line up that opposite corner and get a clean face cut the first time. Oh, I'm a little high, let's correct it. A little bit of terminology in here. Top cut, bottom cut. This point where they come together, that's called the apex. I want to be sure that the apex of my face notch is clean and I don't have any bypass. I haven't crossed the cuts. It's like Ghostbusters, right? Don't cross the streams. So I've got a clean apex. Here's what we've got so far. The orange is what's been cut away. I have made my face cut. So my apex, which will become part of my hinge, is 80% plus or minus the width of the tree, 80% of the diameter. All right, let's go to the bore cut. Remember we talked about traditional a traditional back cut is where I'm cutting through from the back side of the tree. If I were to do that, what am I gonna do with my position? I'm probably gonna get up and go to the other side of the tree, right? So I'm not cutting with the back bar, the top of the bar. I probably would go all the way around and cut from the other side. With a bore cut, I don't have to do that. I can stay right where I am. Whether I'm kneeling or standing, I can make all my cuts from this side, assuming my bar is long enough to go through the tree. So I'm gonna start my bore cut and I'm gonna start back from my hinge. I'm gonna roll the saw on its side and hold the saw horizontal. Having a power head that's appropriately matched with the bar length makes it much easier to make a horizontal cut. If your bar is too long, if you're overbarred or underbarred, the saw will tend to be out of level. When the bar and the saw are, are properly matched, all it takes is a little hand pressure on the rear handle to get that saw level because I want my bore cut, my back cut to be level with my face notch, level with the apex. So when I start my bore, 
I'm I am going to start back from my face cut. I'm going to begin boring, and I'm going to move forward. <laughs> You're going to see me crawling around on the ground because I got a short piece of wood here. But it will enable me to change my position and bore away from away from the hinge. And let me show you what that's going to look like. So here's what we've done so far. We've made our top cut, bottom cut. We have a nice clean apex. And now I'm going to bore. And I'm going to bore away from the hinge, starting back from it and ending up farther back from it on the opposite side of the tree. So I don't have to worry about getting too close on that far corner. That's the side I can't see. I can always then cut closer, but my initial bore is going to go away from the hinge. So let's make that now. All right, back cut, stand clear. Out clear. <laughs> Thumbs are wrapped, right? You see it? I engage the saw and I'm moving toward the camera now. I'm moving toward you. High speed. This is full throttle. And you'll see I'm using my thumb back here on the on the trigger. I'm not trying to wrap my arm underneath. I've got my hand on top of the saw, thumb wrapped here, operating the saw with the thumb of my right hand. At this point, the bar is only an inch or two into the tree, but it's well engaged and I can bore out the other side. All right. I love it that you can put the chain brake on, let go of the saw, and it doesn't make any noise. It's great in the field and it's great for training. It's so easy to talk over these battery saws. All right, so we're bored through, right? I've still got the bar in this orange spot, face cut, bore cut. Now what I need to do is clean up my hinge. I need to leave that hinge the right thickness. So I'm gonna give you another number, five to 10%, right? This is what we're aiming for. Five to 10% is our hinge thickness, front to back, five to 10%. I've got a friend named Svante Hansen from Sweden, and he does this symbol. And he says, oh, I can't do a Swedish accent, but he says, for an easy tree, it's the little finger. That's the thickness. For a difficult tree, it's the thumb. The hinge is that thickness. I don't know what to make of that. Everybody's got different size hands, but five to 10%. And the bigger the tree, the closer to 5%. And the big issue is if you leave that hinge too thick, you can pull and pull all day long. It may not come over. Or if you pull too hard, you can split the tree and have a barber chair and have a much bigger problem. So cutting hinge, cutting your hinge to the proper thickness, five to 10%, thinner is easier to pull over. Thinner is easier to fell. You got to cut it accurately. You got to cut it accurately. All right. So we've bored through. Now I need to set up that hinge. Let's do that. You'll notice that I'm here in front of the saw just a little bit so I can see the apex. I can see, I can see the apex of my face notch. And I'm gonna work the saw back toward it and set my hinge just where I want it. Here we go. Let's double check. And you'll notice I'm gonna go around behind the tree. Yep. Thickness is good on both sides. I've gone for that 5% kind of thickness of my hinge. It's equal on both sides. The hinge, the hinge is parallel sided. It's not wedge shaped. We're not trying to influence the direction of the tree because I will tell you it generally doesn't work and it tends to end badly. Choose a good direction, use your felling sights and make a parallel sided hinge and you will be highly successful in your tree felling. So. I've bore cut this. I've worked with my hinge to get it just right. What do you notice? I'm gonna turn this. The tree is still attached. I can work with my hinge, get it dialed in exactly the way I want it. 
and it still is attached with a strap in the back and the hinge in the front. I've got lots of control. I can comfortably be around this tree as opposed to with a traditional back cut where I may be cutting from the back in and I'm cutting away all my protection and hoping, hoping that I get my hinge just right. A bore cut enables you to do the opposite. It enables me to get the hinge exactly the way I want it before releasing the tree. All right, so let me show you the backside and what we're gonna do. We bored in, we've gotten our hinge just the way we want it. And I'm gonna leave this, some people call it a post. Some people call it a strap or a trigger. I'm gonna leave this in the back. So I need to just clean that up a little bit and get to something that I can then release when I am ready. So we're gonna magically turn the tree. And this one's easy, Joe, I'll be fine on this one. And all I'm doing is using the very tip of the bar to clean this up. I am staying well back from my hinge. All right. We've got a strap set in the back of the tree. I'm going to score it just a little bit so you can see it hopefully pretty well. That's the edge of the strap that we've created in the back of the tree here, this post. This is holding the tree in conjunction with the hinge. I can make sure everything is 100% right before we release this tree. So, open face notch, 70 degrees or more. The, the width of our apex, approximately 80%. The thickness of our hinge, five to 10%. And down the road, hopefully in another series, we can have an extended conversation about hinge thickness and determining the right amount. But for now, let's call it five to 10%. And then here in the back, leaving our strap so that we are ready to release the tree it is still standing and solid. Let's go back to the other camera. All right, so, whew, lots going on. Kale, can you hear me? All right, do we have any questions around these subjects that we should address? What do you have coming in? Cool, let's hit those. Oh, great question. Do we recommend a bore cut every time? In my experience, trees 12 inches diameter or greater are very suitable for a bore cut. Trees smaller than that, it's very, very challenging or impossible to leave enough hinge and have some margin for error as you're making that bore cut. Some of it's gonna be dependent upon the size saw you have and the width of the bar. Obviously, my 90 with a 40 inch bar has a much wider cut when I'm boring than the 540 IXP does. Excellent question. So generally a 12 inch diameter uh, threshold is bore cut versus not. Okay, and then uh, with that, there's a lot of people talking about doing a bore cut and then just following that out the back um, once they get their, their bore cut in. Just wondering about your thoughts on that. Great question. Yeah, so the question is, do we leave, here, let me get my demo piece. Do we leave the strap, some people call it a trigger in the back? And here's the thought. Certainly, if you're highly confident, you have a positive forward lean, you know the zone is clear, can you cut right out the back? Absolutely. What leaving the strap, leaving a trigger does is it gives you one more opportunity to confirm that 
the site is clear, your hinge is set up right, you're happy with the direction of fall before you release the tree. You know the saying, measure twice, cut once? I think that applies here pretty well. That's a great question. Okay, and then um, the other one, technique of um, doing your bore cut if your bar is not long enough to go all the way through. Is there... Oh, awesome question. Yeah. Awesome question. If my bar is not able to go all the way through, it's very doable. You can bore from both sides. The thing to know is your bar has to be more than half the diameter of the tree. More than half. If it's less than half, there are ways to do it, but it gets really, really complex. And it's an advanced technique beyond what I want to get into here. It can be done, but don't put yourself in that situation. Bring a big enough saw. But boring from both sides is very possible. And with a little bit of practice, you'll find you can bore very, very consistently. And you'll often line up your bore cuts from one side to the other. Excellent question. Uh, what do you think about uh, your trigger uh, or your, your release strap? Um, we've got Ironwood Workman is talking about can pull some trees apart. Ah, saying, saying it, great it, question. It, the question it's not I a think. Beginner's... Yeah, I think the question is if we leave a strap in the back, can it pull the wood fibers? And so two thoughts. One is weak wooded trees. Two is decay. In those situations, one, leave the strap or the trigger in a solid section of wood. Don't leave it in decay. Maybe you need to sound the tree with your axe ahead of time to figure out where is the wood most sound. Secondly, on a weak wooded or soft wooded tree, leave a bigger trigger, leave a bigger strap in the back. Obviously, this is a, what, a 10 inch diameter piece of cottonwood. I only had so much room to make this demo for you. I like to think of a, of a strap as being a brick. That's a great size to start with as a sort of a guideline, a brick size in a larger tree. But excellent point. Make sure you're leaving it in sound wood. And two, leave it large enough. If the tree has forward lean, I guess this is the third point, big strap and or reconsider your plan. If you have a tree with very hard forward lean, that is a much more advanced tree. It might seem simple, but the potential for something to pull early and or barber chair is significant. So hard forward lean, treat that as a more complex tree than it might appear. Excellent question. Thanks for bringing it up. Good question. Um, are you going to talk about um, uh, using wedges uh, for this part? Are you going to be getting into that later? Or? Great question. Yeah. Honestly, we're not going to get deep into wedges. You've seen me set them in the <clears throat> videos. Mm -hmm. With a strap like this, on the trees that we were felling out at Evergreen Washelli Memorial Park, we didn't have a rope in the trees. These were pretty small. These were pretty simple. So I set one wedge. I'll show you here. I set one wedge in the tree to sort of preload it with a little bit of energy so that when I released that strap, the tree went on its own. They all had a little bit of positive lean and I just wanted to make sure it went over and I didn't have to go in and cut any further. So we're not gonna get deep into wedging and multiple wedges. In okay. these scenarios and for what we're talking about today, I used it to preload the tree with a little bit of energy. Great gotcha. question. Um, and, and with that, I, I asked because uh, Phil, I believe it was Phil Renaud, asked earlier, um, uh, and I didn't get into it. Uh, maybe if you could just a, a second or two, if there's any, uh, what was this question? Hold on. <clears throat> um, if there's, it was it was Drew Drew McHugh uh, asking about compression on the bottom of the stump uh, when you're using that wedge. Um, and and pushing it up if that creates any problems um, or anything to think about. Hmm. I don't know if Drew, I'm totally understanding your question. Um, when you get into very large trees, the potential for the tree to sit back onto the cut is significant, and leaving a large enough trigger or strap helps support it. 
But if you're in something that's extremely large, you can get one side of it settling a little bit or the other and pinching the bar. And wedges are a great way to make sure you keep that kerf open and don't get pinched uh, on a very large. I don't know if that was your question. I hope I got you something useful there. Okay, great. All yeah, right. Um, Let's continue with the third part of the uh, felling video. Perfect. And here we go. All right, so we made our face cut. We bored through and set up our hinge exactly the way we want it. And I've left a big strap in the back of the tree. This is one edge of my bore cut, this is the other. Our face notch is on the other side. What I'm gonna do <clears throat> is trim this down to a small, sort of, oh, four or five inch wide strap left a couple inches deep in the tree. This is the balance. This is holding the tree from releasing because we do have a forward lane. This is strap in the back is what has enabled me to work on getting my face cut and bore cut exactly right without having committed to moving the tree yet. So I'm going to get that ready and you'll see me put a wedge in Then we'll get ready to fell it. Here we go. So, we set up our trigger, or our strap, in the back of the tree, and I drove a wedge in to preload it, give it a little bit of tension, because we have some forward lean, but I want to make sure when I release that strap, the tree goes on its own. So, everything is set, it's ready to go, we can make sure the area is clear one more time, and then release the tree and put it on the ground. So, let's do that right now. Trigger, stand clear. All right, so our tree's on the ground, went exactly where we intended. And let's just go through the pieces that are here. So this is our face cut, so our bottom cut, top cut was here. Our hinge that we left, it's pretty parallel sided. Maybe could be a little better, but always something to work on, right? So we have our hinge. It's pointed in the direction of fall. Remember, we made the bore cut. We started from your side, bored in, finished it over here, cleaned up, left a strap in the back or a trigger, some people call it. We preset a wedge just for a little bit of tension and then cut away that trigger. And you'll notice when I cut that trigger, I cut pretty much in line with my bore. Why did I do that? In this situation, our tree had positive forward lean. I had a little tension to it. I wanted to be sure it released when I was fully cut through the trigger and I could get away. We didn't have a pull rope in here, so I needed the tree to release on its own or with a wedge and went exactly as we intended. So we made our face. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. So we reiterated a few points in there, saw them in action. And let's just do that here as well. And then let's wrap up with a few key points and answer a few more questions. We got about 10 minutes left. And uh, I've had a good time. I hope you have it as well. So we're looking at the back of the tree, right? Let's spin it around. Face notch over here, hinge, bore cut. And we've got our strap here in the back. So I scored it so it was easy for us to see. I'm going to set my wedge. Oh, I'm going to throw my wedge. To the question earlier about could you pull out the strap early? Yeah, maybe. My goal is not to send the tree over. All I'm doing is giving it a little bit of preload in this case. Just a little bit of energy 
to get it to go on its own. If we have a larger tree, we have a pull rope, maybe we're dealing with back lean, this wedge is just keeping the kerf open. We'll initiate movement using the pull rope. In this case, we'll assume that I'm just going to cut it. So, wedge is in place, get my PPE on, and when I go to release this, I'm going to cut below the kerf of my back cut. If I were to cut above, the possibility for this to release early and catch my saw in the kerf is significant. So I'm going to cut below. In this instance, maybe it's just a little bit below. A larger tree, I might be a few inches below, creating a bypass that can then be broken and the movement initiated with a pull rope. So in this, I'm going to cut a little bit below. So let's do that. Joanna, you got your PPE on? Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So good communication, right? All right. Stand clear, trigger. All clear. She's catching on. She's a heck of a ground squirrel for us. All right, here we go. Releasing it. <laughs> You'll notice what I did and didn't do. I cut below the kerf, but I did not cut below my wedge. If I cut under the wedge and this has any back weight, it'll sit down and pinch. It'll make this wedge useless. So making sure your wedge is away from the strap, away from the trigger, making sure I cut completely underneath and sever that fiber. And that way, let me get my last demo piece. That way we go from having our strap in the back so all that's left is the hinge and the tree can either be pulled over or will go over on its own because of its lean. So the steps we've gone through, technical tree steps of open face notch, proper thickness hinge, five to 10%, using a bore cut so you can set your hinge and make sure it's exactly the way you want it before releasing the tree leaving that strap in place so you have one more opportunity to check. Make sure everything is the way you intend it and the site is clear. And you can release the tree and send it over when you know you're 100% ready. All right, let's review a few key points. Okay, I'll go to the other camera. Ha ha, I'm ahead of you, buddy. I'm ahead. All right. So. What are some of the big things that we covered today? One is we're talking about, I'm probably shouting because I have my muff down. We're talking about urban forestry. We're talking about skills for arboriculture. This is not timber work. This is not logging for board feet. We're using techniques that enable the highest level of precision for working in environments with significant targets. Secondly, two hands on the saw wrapping the thumbs, improve your safety by using that chain break and having a high level of control over your saw. Third, we talked about PPE, ear protection, eye protection, face shield if you got it, leg protection, and then appropriate work boots. If you have chainsaw protective boots or they're required for the job you're on, there's some great choices out there. Gloves. We had a little clarification earlier. These are cut resistant. These are not chainsaw protective gloves. We never, ever, ever put our hands near the moving chain. How do we prevent that? It's simple. Anytime a hand comes off the saw, we engage the chain break. We never have a, a moving chain without both hands on the saw. And further to that, one of my requirements on my job sites, one of my uh, strong feelings is that anytime you set a saw down, that chain break goes on, even if the saw is, saw is shut off. That way, the next person who picks it up doesn't have the possibility of picking up something that would have a moving chain when they started it. So just be, be safe for yourself and take care of the people around you. Use that chain break. It's the easiest thing in the world. We talked about battery saws, and you've probably picked up more than once. I love battery saws. I think they're an amazing tool. They're the direction of this industry. Uh, I think the new 540 IXP, this saw here from Husqvarna, is a big step forward. I've got uh, the older, the 536 that came out early. I've had them for four years. 
They were great. They're great saws. I still enjoy them. The 540 is a big step up. And if you've been hesitant to try a battery saw, give this one a shot. Let's be real. It's specced for 16 inch bar. It is not the same as a 550. It's not the same as a, as a uh, 572 or a 390. It's not a huge saw, but it's super capable. Those trees we were cutting at the cemetery, 16 inch birch with a 16 inch bar and a battery saw. I was super pleased with how this thing ran. It really did well. So if you haven't tried a battery saw, give this a shot. It's, uh, it's been a game changer for me. Love the idea that there's no idle, no fumes, and no vibration. So if you haven't tried it, give it a shot. And the biggest thing, stop doing this. What I mean is battery saws are so much better on my right shoulder because I'm not pull starting that darn saw all day long. It makes a big difference. So give it a shot. Talk to your local dealer. They'll bring a demo out for you. Um, talk to other people who've used them. Hell, you can contact me directly. I'll share more of my experience with you, but uh, I couldn't be more pleased. Uh, and they're super easy to maintain. So uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, let's see what remaining questions we have. You guys have been and gals have been great submitting really good, insightful questions. Uh, I've tried to answer them the best we can and keep us within the scope of our subject matter. Um, something that I want to sort of tease up for you is I was just talking with Nick Bonner earlier today, and we're going we're gonna to move forward seeing if we can put together a whole chainsaw skills training series that would be available online through the, I think it's called the Tree U, the, uh, the Tree Stuff University. That's all around chainsaw skills, including much more work with technical trees, hazard trees, uh, and to get you a full complement of training around chainsaw skills and safety. And uh, if that's something you're interested in, we'd love to hear your feedback. Tree Stuff would love to hear your feedback. That's something we're working toward, and I hope we can do that for you. So, Kale, if, uh, if you can walk us through, are there a couple more questions that we have time to answer? Um, I, it looks like I have maybe one or two uh one that i had a question as well uh you meant to drop that tree on the pavement great question yes i meant to drop the tree on the pavement i'm glad you asked and let me explain why my friends we were cutting trees in a cemetery and as we considered our options and the condition of the trees the pavement was exactly the right answer and let me give be a little more detail. One is where we were working is all grave sites with flat, they call them grave markers. And it didn't feel respectful to me to be dropping trees on grave markers. And I would imagine you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Secondly, these are birches where the tops are dead and they're punky. These any limbs that were there shattered when we dropped them on the pavement. So whoever asked that question, I, I give you a gold star for being perceptive. <laughs> I thought initially, man, do I really want to put it on the pavement? And the answer was considering our other targets and considering the site and the condition of the trees, putting them on the pavement was no problem. So excellent question I'm glad you asked. It's great. Be great. Yeah, I I don't think there would I don't think everyone would have thought about that. They would have just laid it down. So um, the other thing, um, I, I don't, there's a whole, there's a massive thread, uh, if you haven't read it already, I haven't read it, um, on, uh, kickback and depth cutters and how the actual forces work on here, um, between oh, a couple yeah. people. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Go for it. That's, it's above me. All right. So this is going to be the one minute. Nah, two minute answer. Uh, and I apologize, we don't have too much more time than that. Let's put the battery out. So, on our chainsaw, we have the cutting tooth and we have the depth gauge. Let's see if I can do this without dropping it. Depth gauge, cutter tooth. The gap, the distance in height, the difference in height, I should say, between the cutter tooth and the depth gauge is what determines how big a bite that tooth takes as it passes through the wood. So a properly sharpened chain, a properly maintained saw has a difference in height, a gap or an exposed tooth of approximately 0.030 inches, 30 thousandths of an inch. 
roughly the thickness of a credit card. So what does that mean for us? It means that if we keep that uh, ratio or that difference of the cutter tooth to the depth gauge at that same difference, we'll have a saw that cuts consistently. We make sure our left and right side cutters are properly sharpened and that depth gauge is properly lowered. Our saw will cut straight and true. It won't dish. It won't cut salad bowls. When we want to hot rod a saw or we think that's a good idea and we start reducing or lowering those depth gauges, we increase the bite that that cutter tooth takes and we increase the likelihood of kickback or binding in the cut. On the opposite end, when those depth gauges are too high, we don't lower depth gauges every few times we sharpen the saw. We'll run our saw at full throttle and we'll just cut powder. We'll get dust coming out because we're not taking a big enough bite. So getting those properly adjusted, using a depth gauge tool, there's a variety of them out there, is a great way to make sure your saw is cutting well. A sharp tooth and a properly adjusted depth gauge will ensure your saw performs to the best it possibly can. And regarding kickback, like we talked about earlier, lowering those depth gauges increases the likelihood of kickback because more of the cutting tooth is exposed. And like we talked about, when the, when the chain, I wonder if I can move this here, when the chain moves over the bar, as the cutter tooth gets up to that top corner, we call it the kickback zone. Up in here, the depth gauge lowers first and exposes more of the cutting tooth. And that makes this corner, this quadrant of the saw, the point where we are most likely to take too big a bite, where the, the chain is gonna stop in the wood and we'll get rotational kickback and the saw will come up and out of the cut. So that's the two minute answer to sharpening, adjusting depth gauges, and how does kickback happen? Very nice. I think that's a whole, I think two minute answers with Craig is our, our new YouTube, uh, uh, YouTube chainsaw safety playlist that we're going to have. Oh, um, I like it. Yeah. I like I, it. Do it. I don't think there are, uh, any other real questions in here that, that haven't been touched on or somebody hasn't, uh, gone over in the, um, in the comments. I think you did a great job making it so that there's, you know, not many questions you can come up with. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, I think it was a great webinar. Well, wait, before you go, Kale. Yes. Before you go, Kale, I got something I want to add. Uh, a couple things. One is I want to say thank you to everyone who participated. Everyone who submitted questions, everyone who joined us online, everyone who shares this webinar with others at their work or others in their local Arborist Tree Worker community. I want to thank you for... Um, for participating. I want to thank you for being open to learning, for opening your mental toolbox and adding to it. It's my great desire to support all of us and to be part of the elevation and improvement of our profession and the safety of every one of us who do this really cool job. Secondly, I want to recognize um, an arborist who just passed. Uh, some of you may know Justin Hoffmeister. He was a long time, third, fourth, fifth generation tree worker. I'm sorry that I don't know. Uh, in the uh, Centralia area, just south of Olympia, Washington. And Justin passed on uh, from a medical condition. He passed on at home about two weeks ago. Justin was a fellow trainer with me when we worked together at North American Training Solutions. Justin dedicated himself to improving those around him, to having a good sense of humor, to working for the good of others. Uh, he was an inspiration to me. Many of you may have known him. Uh, if not, ask somebody who is Justin Hoffmeister. Uh, he left us too soon. Uh, he left a family behind, and we're all sad to see him go. Uh, he will be missed. So to Justin, um, it's a pleasure to know you. I was honored to know you, my friend. Uh, sorry to lose you so soon. Uh, and lastly, I want to make a big thank you, Kale, to you for uh, working through our technical difficulties today. For everybody who joined us for bearing with us with our technical difficulties, uh, to Nick Hunter and Tree Stuff for the awesome opportunity to be here with you today, uh, to stand on my back deck and talk to all of you, spend an afternoon or an evening together to improve our knowledge and our skills, answer some awesome questions. It's been an honor and a privilege. 
Kale's got uh, some information for you about CEUs. He'll have a link to that CEU quiz to get your ISA CEUs. Uh, thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you next time. And please keep an eye out for more information as we work on that chainsaw series that we're hoping to bring to you through TreeU at Tree Stuff. From uh, Craig Bachman and Tree133 here in Seattle, be careful out there. Enjoy this wonderful career. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person here sometime soon. That's all I have. Thank you.